Well, welcome everyone to another episode of the Fire These Times. We are a growing podcast that is also part of a growing collective called From the Periphery. For all of the usual information, you can check out uh, fromtheperiphery.com. We also have a Patreon as well as an Apple Podcast subscription services, which allow, allows us to, of course, grow. Uh, and uh, those who join us other than joining a pretty cool community, if I may say so myself, get like exclusive podcast episodes, uh, access to our monthly hangout, access to the weekly Palestine uh, fan club, as well as other perks that we're uh, basically building every every month or so. We're adding new stuff, and there's going to be exclusive podcasts as well. There's already a couple of them. There's going to be more soon, which we'll be working on. Um, I'm your uh, well, one of your hosts today, Elia Ayub, and I'm joined today by Leila Esra, as well as our guest Elias. Uh, let's do some very quick rounds of intro. Uh, no, no particular uh, order. Uh, Esra, Leila, and then Elias, and we'll take it from there. Hi everyone, I'm Esra. I use they/them pronouns. Um, I'm a new member of the collective, and I'm really excited to be here. Hi everyone, I'm Leila. I've been with. I'm also a fairly new member of the collective. Uh, also happy to be here. Hi everyone, I'm Amelias Jashan. Um, I'm a guest on uh, on the Fire These Times, and I'm honoured to be part of it. Well, it's an honour to have you with us. We will be talking about a book that you edited, uh, and that was released two years now, I think. Yeah, two years now. Yeah. Yeah. Um, Esra, you, I know you'll have like most of the questions because you have so many thoughts that you shared with us before recording. But, um, why don't we start with, uh, yes, like give us a bit of a, for, you know, for our listeners who haven't checked it out yet, uh, give us the pitch if you see what I mean. Sure. So, um, the book is, the book is called, uh, This Arab is Queer. It's a nonfiction anthology of essays, short, short, uh, short memoirs and, and creative nonfiction and, and even a poem. Um, and it's, uh, 18 chapters of, from different, uh, 18 different, uh, queer uh, writers from around the world. Um, some are based in the, the Swana region. Some are based in the diaspora. Um, some of them, like me, were born and raised in the diaspora. Some of them straddle the two worlds. They go back and forth. Um, and so some of them are recent refugees, um, but they grew up there or recent immigrants. So it's a, it's a diverse set of experiences. And, um, yeah, and it's, it's not, uh, I mean, there's, there's, you know, it covers the full spectrum of the LGBTQI, um, identities as well. And, uh, yeah, so it came out in the UK in June 2022 and, 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 uh, other, other English language bookstores in Europe as well, and in, in Australia and New Zealand as well. And it came out in North America in October 2022. Um, but yeah, so it's been an amazing journey since then. It's definitely been life changing publishing that book. Um, and I think uh, it's been humbling as well, seeing the response that the book has had from readers. Um, and, just, and yeah, it just, just makes me realize that I, t- I completely underestimated how much of a need this book was. Uh, if that makes sense. Um, yeah. So, yeah. And, uh, I mean, the book was a long time coming. Like, it was an idea brewing in my head for a while. And then, you know, the lockdown happened and I suddenly had no social life. So I had to uh, just use the time to put <laughs> the book together. <laughs> um, <laughs> um, yeah. So, and there were some things that lead up, led up to, there were some, uh, light bulb moments or, uh, specific, uh, incidences around the world or, Oh, and personally as well, that sort of helped crystallize the idea to, to for, for the book to become what it is. And, um, yeah, so it's just been, it's been really life changing. It's been amazing. And, uh, and I, one thing I will say before we go on, I guess, is I wanted to make sure the book wasn't just, you know, a collection of trauma porn after trauma porn after trauma porn. I, just, I specifically told the writers, you know, to, the power is in their hands. Um, I wanted them to, wanted them to, share stories that they felt was important. Um, I didn't want them to worry about pandering to what, you know, the white gaze demands of them or expects of them. Um, you know, wanted to help challenge the whole gatekeeping uh, of who gets to decide to publish our stories and what t- t- what types of stories they are. Um, yeah. Well, maybe I'll, I'll start with um, the first question because – the, the book was published in the UK and the US, mm-hmm. but I'm quite interested to how it's been received in the Arab world and what kind of response you've had from other Arabs. Yeah, look, um, it, it, it's available in Lebanon as well, um, in the English language bookshops there, um, with, with Alia's bookshop and I think 
uh, my publisher had a bookshop in Beirut, uh, Dara Zaki. And I think it's available in other shops as well. Um, because I've been tagged in random book clubs and stuff around the world. And some of them are in Lebanon as well. So, but the response I've had from the Arab world had been like 95 from my just personal anecdotal, anecdotal. So it's been 95% positive. Um, and I can't even remember that small minority of people who don't like it. Um, and sure, most of those, most of that positive response does come from queer Arabs, Arabs themselves. Um, cause a lot of them download the book digitally and read it on Kindle or on their iPad. Um, especially if they're in a country where it's dangerous to sort of carry the book around because it's, it's got rainbow on it. Um, so it's, and a lot of countries have banned just that, sim- that symbolism. Um, so having it, having the digital format was a safe way. Um, and yeah, it's been, it's been really, really amazing seeing how this book has got into their hands and how they're able to read that at home where they, you know, in, in a place where in a culture or society that might not necessarily accept them all the time. Um, and also uh, the other like 40% of positive responses comes from people who as far as I'm concerned, are not part of the queer community. Um, so there's allies and it's just like, it's really, um, vindicating, I guess, to, to get that because it really turns that stereotype on its head. And that's the stereotype I'm talking about is when people say to me, Oh, the Arab do not accept you. You know, they're all homophobes and whatever. It's just, they just paint the community as this one generic, homogenous, um, monstrous society. Which is obviously not true. So having allies in the community is just like I've always known there's been allies in the community, but seeing that response from our allies has been just really just challenges that perception that um, you know, we're not homogenous, we're actually human beings, we all have different different points of views. And, you know, there are people, many people amongst us who can think critically. Um, so yeah. That's awesome. Um, I'm curious about uh when, when your publishing process. So in the book, you talk about like one of the themes is the fetishization of Arab queerness. Um, and so like in the publishing process itself, uh, did you hit that, especially as publishing in English, as you said, in the UK? Like, yeah. I mean, I mean, there's definitely been some personal anecdotes as a baby gay living in Sydney where I've been fetishized as a gay Lebanese. Um, right. Because especially um, with Sydney, I, I, I often joke Sydney is, is the Dearborn of the Southern Hemisphere. I've never been to Dearborn, but just by the way that there's a really big Lebanese community in Sydney is very, very visible. It kind of gives it gives off the Dearborn vibe. <laughs> um, <laughs> um, and even though I'm, I'm from that sort of that community and the the queer community in Sydney is quite big and visible as well, you'd think that be more open. There would have been such casual racism and fetishization, but I still experience that. Um, so there's that. And just with the whole publishing in English and um, the fetishization that comes from that, I mean, I haven't really experienced it in that sense. And I think, like, I'm very conscious of the fact that it is published in English, um, simply because English, especially for us in the diaspora, not so much, I guess, but in, from the, um, the Swano region, it is a language of English. Like, you'd have to come, mm-hmm. you have to be educated, you have to have access to the, level of education to be able to speak English fluently and stuff. And so for that reason, it might not be accessible to a lot of queers who don't know how to speak English um, when Arabic is their first language. So I'm very, very conscious of that. But the other side of the coin is if, if we did go Arabic, then that would just make the book more vulnerable to censorship and homophobia from authorities because they literally have an aneurysm over the fact that there's queer themes written in the Arabic language. You know, yeah. God forbid if that ever happens, even though we exist, but you know, so, um, yeah. So I guess there's, there's that. And yeah, I, I haven't really seen the fetishization in any other way, um, with the publishing in English, but definitely like, you know, and I'm, I'm not speaking from my, I'm speaking, uh, but after speaking to some other queers as well, they've all experienced fetishization in some different ways. Um, for me, or just, you know, being, con- uh, or even just, Stuff that might not be a fetish thing, but it's just like con- constant reductive tropes of being gay or Arab or whatever. And, uh, I often like 
the number of times I told people, oh, I'm Lebanese or Palestinian, that the immediate response would be, oh, I love hummus, oh, I love tabbouleh, or if I, um, you know, and then sometimes, because I'm quite white passing, um, that I get a lot, I used to get a lot of cis white gay men in Sydney say, oh, you're not like the other Arabs. So, you know, what does that mean? <laughs> um, or if I tell them I'm not Muslim, they're like, oh, that, that's okay then. I'm like, well, what does that mean? Like, you know, they're still part of our community. Um, and, uh, but the, the funniest thing, and it still sometimes happens now when I tell people that, um, I'm Palestinian and gay. It's like, you can just see in their eyes, they're trying to compute. So how can I possibly be Palestinian and gay at the same time? It's like, you know that meme of the woman who's just like looking confused and all these mathematical equations goes over her face? That yeah. what these is that real life enactment of that. Um and it's really hilarious seeing that because some people just they just have these preconceived notions of what being Palestinian Palestinian is, and they just can't seem to understand that I can be both. Um and of course you get the odd, odd racist or Zionist will say, Oh, try being gay in Gaza or whatever. And or they'll throw you off a rooftop, whatever. And even though Hamas has never had never done that, um, uh, I've, it's got to a point now when people say that to me, I'm like, well, I, give me my passport. You, you're basically advocating for the right of return. Send me back, you know. Um, but yeah, let's test out that theory. <laughs> so let's test the theory out. Give us the passport and let's see what happens. <laughs> 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 right. Yeah. Yeah, I mean, this book was honestly, for me, really moving. I felt incredibly seen and heard um, in a lot of the the stories shared. Uh, and you're right, like, I, I mean, I'm reading your introduction, seeing like, you're, you're not sure, like, what, what other book is out there. Um, and the nuances of the experience of uh, being Arab or North African and queer and like, what it actually affirmed for me my queerness, right? Because in my head, this is my internalized uh, Orientalism, right? Um, being like, oh yeah, if I'm not being ostracized, if I'm not blah blah blah, if I'm not super out there, if I'm not acting a certain way, then am I actually queer? Is how the two fit into each other? Um, but reading through this, the variety of the experiences and the nuances, and between what like the definitions of queerness and how people are interacting with their queerness and how what queerness means to them uh really stood out for me um and that was one of the big themes right for me is like what queerness versus homonationalism um and what that means uh and within our community right and the nuances of that especially religion i love the fact that islamic religion was invoked a lot and also like all types of religion was invoked god was invoked and working through the process of being told that god doesn't love you doesn't doesn't want you this way, and yet God made me this way. So how do I bring those two together, right? Um, yeah, like incredibly moving book and incredibly touching. Uh, it's really nice what you say. Um, I'm, I'm, it's, it's always interesting uh, speaking to people who've read the book and hearing their interpretations of the story, and how they, um, uh, you know, their their journey of reading with the book. Everyone's got a completely different response, and um, and yeah, it's not like I, I didn't envision that. Like I didn't ever really think that that would happen. I just thought. I guess I was so holed up in my own interpretation of the book, putting it together, editing it, and I got so close with the uh, writers and the and their stories that I didn't for a second think, okay, the readers will interpret it this way, that way, that way. Like, you know, I don't have an MFA or anything, so I didn't really think that way. It's just like, it's just been really nice and to hear that. Um, yeah. Well, how, how, what were you thinking? I'm kind of curious, like, as, as you mean, put this together, what I was your... Process, yeah. I had impost I had imposter syndrome for a long time in the lead up to don't this. Like, don't me <laughs> Yeah, like I mean, even though I did sell myself to to the publisher, sort of like convince them that I'm the right person to do it. Once they picked it up, I was like, oh shit, what have I done? Um, so it was just like, and I, I sort of had to sort of like my husband had to sort of talk me off the ledge, just saying you are the right person, just calm down. Um, and I, I'm a chronic overthinker, but I I did have imposter syndrome, thinking like why why me like why can't it be someone else and whatever and but i guess you know coming from a journalism background and being queer out of myself and having worked in queer media back in sydney um i guess that just reminding myself that i do have that track record and i was in the right place to do it just right the person right, right person to do it um but at the same time i did sometimes wonder like you know 
am I taking up space as someone in the diaspora rather than someone in the Middle East? Should they, should they be someone from there do it, not me? But I know it's more complicated than that, especially for me as a Palestinian. Like, I can't go back. And my mum's Lebanese. I can't get passport through her. So, you know, um, it's just like, I'll be perpetually in the diaspora until Pal- Palestine is free. Um, does that answer your question? Is it, is it, yeah, yeah. Yes, <laughs> absolutely. Um, yeah, it's... So the people in the um, I know some of the author, some of the authors I actually recognize from the like Mona is someone I've been following for a while, mm-hmm. um, and I know some of them are out, but I'm actually not sure. Is everyone in the book where they like about okay? And so um, as you were going through this process, um, I, I'm curious about like approaching the authors and like because it is incredibly vulnerable. These are incredibly like personal vulnerable like they're putting their hearts out in ways that yeah. like you know it's like um yeah it's and that's that's kind of and it gives me courage uh, so i will share this since we're being public <laughs> um th- this is my, my like i'm i'm out with queer in in the, my chosen community right and so this is for me as an academic and as a scholar in this space right here together this is my first time really truly being public with my queerness um and part of it is reading this book and seeing what's being said and the courage it takes to step into that and own the nuances of everything that's happening, the spirituality and and rejecting the conditioning and what's been put into us um, and saying, no, I'm not going to listen to you. I'm not going to listen to all this hegemonic bullshit. I'm going to do the work that I need to do to get in touch with myself and my God and build that relationship, you know? Um, Yeah. I don't know if there's a question there. I was just reflecting. <laughs> no, no, I was just saying, thank you for sharing that. That's, uh, that's really amazing. And, um, you know, yeah, like, obviously, this, this is all about you. This journey is your journey and your journey only. No one should ever tell you how to do it. Um, and, uh, yeah, that's that's just a really brave of you to say that. So just thank, thank you for sharing that. Yeah. these. I mean, again, these are because it's the courage that's being presented in this book. And... I mean, I have definitely thought about as I was reading it, I was like, what it's it's interesting that you brought up immediately we jumped in like this is written in English. And if it were written in Arabic, it would bring on a, a different level of scrutiny and like danger. Um, and I found myself really thinking about, like you said, those who aren't English speakers, who aren't of privilege and what this would mean to them. Uh, yeah. Uh, but, but don't get me wrong. I would absolutely love this book to be translated into like this. Like, I'll be in. A dream of mine yeah. but for me to do that i would need to speak to each of the contributors one-on-one to make yeah. sure they're okay with that because it's okay to be translated in other languages but when it goes back to the mother tongue and the mm-hmm. the emotional load that comes with that it's just like we've got to be really careful um oh, yeah so yeah so i mean whatever happens in the future it might happen but at this stage there's no real plan um but yeah like i, if, I just wish we did live in a world where writing this sort of thing in arabic wouldn't cause so much controversy wouldn't cause any controversy at all um but i think we're still a, f- a, a while off from that and I, but I would like to think that things will change for the good in our lifetime and you know the young generations will be able to pick up a book like this in the arabic language and read stuff about the queer experiences or the nuances that come with that um without authorities jumping on their back or or shaming them to do so because you know as you said we're all born this way god made us this way so you know yeah do, do you do you feel elias that things have changed since the arab spring because it's my impression since the arab spring i lived in the arab world between 2000 and 2016 and mm. certainly it was very taboo people didn't talk openly about being gay and um, also people didn't talk openly about being atheist those were two things that i personally noticed after the arab spring that more people were open about talking about their sexuality, talking about their non-belief in God. And, um, you know, some different initiatives started in Syria. There was a magazine that was set up at that time around the Arab Spring. I know in Jordan, there's also a magazine which has faced quite a bit of clampdown by the authorities. Um, But I'm wondering, from your perspective, do you think things have changed? There's been more of an opening. Um, I I, I wouldn't say I've got the authority to speak in there because I haven't lived there. I've only ever visited. Um, but just from like, you know, general observations as 
living in the outside and, li- and working in our media as well, um, news media. I, I do think it's changed, but it's just, I'll be, I wouldn't say yes, no, black and white answer. I think it depends on which country, which culture you're dealing with. So, for example, I know in Egypt, uh, after the fall of Mubarak, and and then when the Muslim Brotherhood were in power, apparently, speaking to some queer Egyptians, apparently that was the most liberating time to be queer, which is like, uh, which I, th- I think a lot of people did not expect because of the conservative ideas that come with being the Muslim Brotherhood. But they were a democratically elected government at the end of the day, whether anyone supports them or not. And I guess because of that, there was, there was a lot of freedom and the, so- the society was testing the water to see how far they could go. But then when Sisi came in, there's been a massive clack clack down and there's no secret on that. That's awful stuff that he'd done with the community in Egypt since he's come to power. Um, uh, with places like, uh, Syria, I, I've been, I, I, I do know what the publication you're talking about, but I haven't heard of them since it's because of the civil war and stuff. Yeah. And in Jordan, um, my Cali magazine, I think that's, is that what the plaque? Yeah, yeah. That's the name, I think. Um, yeah. So I do know they've had a lot of, uh, they've had a lot of runnings with authorities there. Uh, but they still publish. They still have an online presence. They've never had a physical magazine. It's always been a digital magazine. And they still publish and they still commission authors and publish, uh, writers and stuff. And, um, but I don't, I don't think they're like the, the website is not registered in Jordan anymore. It's web is registered. They can, they can just circumnavigate the, um, authorities in that way. And um and the founder Khaled Abdul Hadi, who, who contributed to my book, he now lives in Paris. Um, but I think he goes back to Amman every now and then. Anyway, um, so yeah, so I guess in many ways, uh, Jordan may probably may have taken some steps back, but if they still haven't criminalized homosexuality. Like Jordan and Palestine, with the exception of the Gaza Strip, um, are the only two Arab countries where there's, no, where there's no legal statute that criminalizes homosexuality, but at the same time, there's nothing protecting the community. Um, in Lebanon, uh, which is a weird one, there are sodomy laws and stuff that are interpreted for being, you know, homophobic laws. But in, in Lebanon, they call it uh, quote unquote acts against nature. So you have, you yeah, have yeah. one judge or at least a few of them who've said, well, you know, you have homosexuality in nature, therefore it's not an act against nature, therefore it's fine. So, it, but it's very much dependent on the areas and the interpretations and the whatever. But yeah, yeah, yeah. And, and I know there have been some, several like district court cases that have been in favor of homo- the 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 uh, the queer community. So basically, shutting up the homophobes. But it hasn't reached the level of um, the the government to sort of no. make those amendments. Yeah, yeah. But at the same time, like the queer community in Lebanon is thriving. Like it, they're so visible. Um, at least from at least from what I see on social media, it seems so visible, and there's a, a lot of out and proud uh, queer people in Lebanon, um, and yeah. So, but then you get the Gulf countries, a whole different story. Like it just chops and changes, and just, I mean, just the recent ban on rainbow colors in Qatar and the Saudi Arabia and all that stuff is just like it's a step. It might might be small, but it's the symbolism that comes with that just a massive step back, and. Um, yeah, so it just it just changes all the time, and um, and even even Tunisia, like I do know that they had some moments of uh, a few years of progress, and things were moving forward. And there's a community, there's a advocacy group or and or local community group called Mojadin, um, that are, I think they're based in Tunis, but they sort of work with everyone from the Maghreb, from uh, Algeria, Morocco, and Tunisia. But um, but ever since Case Said. Came back to power, took pretty much made emerges new power, or whatever became a dictator essentially. Uh, I think things have been a bit shaky, um, but yeah. So I, I mean, that's just from my observations. I guess it depends on the government of the day, um, and where and when the last reforms were made. And even in Lebanon, where there's been that's a thriving community, you still got idiots going around saying homophobic shit to distract from the economic crisis and just distract from all that shit. Yeah. So, I mean, the most recent example, horrific example, was when the um the uh the, the soldiers of God just terrorized no, that bar no, no, no. they... Yeah, 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 yeah. Um, but I just called them as uh, uh, uh something exib- like they're just it was just idiots. I have no respect for them. Um, and just because it was like a, a it wasn't even a gay bar in Beirut. It was like a bar that would just like happen to be accommodating in an act that. Friendly to the queer community, they were had, had a drag show. Um, so yeah, it's just 
So it's just like, I guess there's no like black and white answer to that. Um, but it, even in the diaspora, that the stigma that comes with homosexuality is still really strong, especially if, I mean, maybe for, uh, it, I think it depends on which country, but I guess in North America and Australia and some parts of Europe where immigrant families have established themselves since the 70s or 60s or 50s even, um, the stigma in those societies, those cultures, the communities, sorry, are probably still quite strong. And that's something I experienced personally in Sydney. Um, but, you know, you're just battling with that. You're dealing with parents or grandparents who have this like frozen idea, memory of their country. And then, you know, their home country progressed and moved on and they just sort of stuck in this, like what the village was like in the fifties, you know? Um, so yeah, they don't understand. So I think uh, when I, I remember having a chat with my mom about how there were the gay bars in Beirut years ago, and she was like a bit taken aback, like she couldn't believe there would be gay bars in Beirut. Um, and then we went, and then we went to Lebanon together. And I told her one night, I'm going to go to a gay bar in um in Hombra. It was a uh, bardo, which is shut down. And um and she didn't bat an eye. So I was, okay, that's progress. <laughs> um. So yeah, I mean, so I guess um, yeah. So I'm just giving you for. A, Went off on a tangent there. Sorry, Layla. <laughs> Great. I'm curious. I can add just one. So for me, like, I'm so I'm not I'm not queer. Uh, uh, we have other similar backgrounds in the sense like I'm also Lebanese Palestinian. I'm also not Muslim. I, I just love saying I'm also not Muslim <laughs> for, the, for some of the reasons that you mentioned. But for me, the experience has been reading the book, which was a while ago now, um, has the effect of what I think you might call a queering certain expectations. Um, I've experienced personally in being on the receiving end of that in the sense that like I would, people, for example, would assume, for example, I'm Muslim, you know, and then I say, I'm not. And then there's be like, as you mentioned, that meme of people kind of, they're almost like their brain is, sh- you know, short circuiting or whatever. Um, and the other thing is I come from like a very specific, or at least if, if it, growing up, it was a very small community, very conservative, uh, Maronite community. Um, and my own kind of process of rediscovering part of that heritage that's not just right wing as it's usually associated with uh, due to for like various historical reasons. And in reading like the, the red priest, uh, Gregoire Haddad, who was actually a socialist and other folks like that. And also meeting some, some people like that. And of course, other who, um, move between that boundary of what you might call like religiosity and secularism, which I think, uh, even the, cause you, you we mentioned like the, the difference between what, how it was under the Muslim Brotherhood versus how it's been under CC, even kind of complicating, which I would say is like, it is a form of querying that, that divide between those two, because, uh, sometimes or often even it's not whether there is rel- religiosity, uh, even assuming you can even, you can even quantify that necessarily. Um, I have like, you know, relatives who are very, very Catholic, very religious, but like are just chill about most things. Whereas I have others who I, even would call themselves atheists who are like, but socially conservatives. And there's just like different ways that someone might interpret their even relationship with their own religion, their God or what, what have you. And for me, it's been interesting to see like, I've, so I read the book and in many ways like, well, okay, I'm not the audience. Sure. I can, you know, like I'm someone like I'm going through this thought process. I'm not the, the, the audience. At the same time, I recognize some of those experiences as either my own or uh, those of very close friends of mine, let's say, who are queer in this case. Um, it's almost like I had this weird, I don't know how to say, it's not like, not saying like an out of body experience or anything like that, but just realizing reading something when you're not technically the audience, but at the same time, you're also not, not the audience, if you see what I mean. And just being in yeah. between those two and beyond. And I don't know, it's, it's been, it's been weird, but in, in an interesting way is what I'm trying to say. Yeah. I think, yeah. I think it's really interesting, Eli, because I, one of the things that came up for me when I was reading the book is if you focus on the experience of being queer, and coming to terms with you, uh, one's queerness, it's not different than what you read in like English speakers, right? Like it's it's still the same process of like trying to detangle the the hetero like the the homogenic um, the hegemonic system, right? The patriarchy and white supremacy and all that stuff that is what's the core of confusing all this for us, right? And then you have the nuanced piece of like. Islamophobia and Orientalism in the West and like how we're perceived as Arab North African bodies, right? Um, and and that adds like that's the piece that I was like, oh yeah, I see myself in this book because it's coming from the voices of people who are bringing in those cultural experiences. 
But at the, the coreness of what queerness and like unpacking what queerness is, it, it's, it, it was very mirroring of like all my other queer scholarship reading, right? Like it, it's not different. Um, yeah. <laughs> yeah. Yeah. No, really, I think it's uh, one, one thing I would mention again, and maybe it can lead to, to a question as well, is that uh, we mentioned, again, you mentioned Muslim Brotherhood and CC. And for me, it's been, it's been an interesting shift because Ultimately, there seems to be at least at least a correlation between the freer a society is in the sense of being more democratic and its mm-hmm. attitudes towards, you know, quote unquote minorities. It almost, mm-hmm. almost it's like self self evident to say so because, like, well, yeah, that that would be the case. But because it's the Arab world, and especially because of then we're having this conversation in English, and there is this tendency of uh, perceiving again to go back to religiosity as like religion equals more conservative atheism or secularism however that is defined and often it's not even defined um equals you know more progressive and yet what we see time and time again is that you know a a secular dictatorship can be like the most anti-communist anti-socialist anti-queer anti-whatever as we've seen whether it's syria whether it's saudi arabia whether it's egypt and that there is no necess- there's no correlation between those two because as as you know we've been saying even the way we i think and this is part of my own process of deorientalizing, in many ways, my own heritage. The way uh, I grew up approaching religion, I think at some point changed once I started internalizing forms of Orientalism. That I had, I actually, in, I grew up in Lebanon. I, you know, I didn't, I wasn't born there, but I grew up from like the age of two to the age of twenty-five, and I knew almost nothing else up until that age. And I, as I said, even didn't have even non-Christian friends for a long time. The anecdote I usually give is I didn't even know that Muslims use the word Allah because I didn't know any Muslims until like the age 16 or 17. Um, and so again, this whole querying of the, because of the expectations of how it is, how the word Allah, for example, the thought is talked about in, in the West, you know, and versus how, what that actually means for me and what, you know, all of that. Anecdotally, I, I was listening to a podcast that focuses on the far right and they were, uh, play, they were playing a clip of a far right, um, pastor somewhere in the u.s i think in tennessee or something um and he was like insulting the sons of allah is how he was putting it and of course for me as someone who grew up as a christian arab it's like what you you think you're talking about muslims but muslims don't call themselves sons sons of allah and there's only one son of allah if you believe in christianity and that is jesus (laughs) so like you're you're not (laughs) insulting the people you think you're insulting and that, that was for me, it's always this bizarre. And again, obviously I go, I was 10 when 9-11 happened. So everything has just been that, right? Anyway, I don't want to make it about that necessarily. I just, I, I see these parallels even when it's not, of course, not the same experience. And I, you know, I didn't, I didn't suffer in the same way and, and, and I didn't have the same consequences on like my person body or, or, or psychology or what have you. It's just like, it's almost like you can change certain words in uh, some of those stories and like some of the experiences. And it would resemble uh, a bit more like mine. Not, again, not saying like there are exact parallels or anything like that. But yeah, anyway, I wanted to share that. Mm-hmm. In, mm-hmm. I mean, for me, it's like uh, in, in the diaspora, like, you know, because growing up in Sydney, the Lebanese community there is still predominantly Christian because Australia had a white Australia policy, like literally called white Australia policy up until the early 70s. And my parents were able to immigrate in the mid to late 60s because they were Christian and they weren't considered Arab or you know, whatever. They were able to circumnavigate. I think America had a similar thing with, um, you know, they were considered uh, Europeans or Caucasians or whatever. They were, you know. Um, anyway, so and it wasn't until probably the mid-70s and onwards when the Civil War in Lebanon started that we got Lebanese Muslims coming into Sydney. Um, and that, that I've never experienced any sort of sectarian tensions in, that, in my community there. Um, but because, uh, you know, being like in my early teens, when before 9-11 even happened, um, I was bombarded with media headlines on TV and newspapers of these um, Middle Eastern gangs in Western Sydney where I grew up. And it was so bad to the point that, you know, there was a, a they became gang rapes because women became victims and, and they were always white women. It just became this, you know, ads against or the white community and then the state police in the, the state grew up in established the middle eastern crime network um and so i was suddenly dealing with all this racism as a young kid who had no idea what it was all about and um as a way to sort of make myself feel better 
I would say, oh, but they were Muslim. Does it mean I'm, I'm different to them? And it wasn't until my dad sat me down and said to me, like, listen, we are the, we are, we're, we're all the same, you know, don't ever judge someone based on their religion, whatever. He, he, he give, gave me a full lecture. And I'll never forget that conversation. I was probably about 11 years old when that happened. And I'll never, ever forget. It. It's just left a lasting mark on me. And so by the time 9-11 came, I was like ready to go. I knew what to say. I had, I've been educated, you know. Um, and I think, yeah, when 9-11 came, I was 16 years old at that time. So, yeah, so it was pretty uh, intense to see that. And then, but it all made sense because my dad, I, I only found this out recently, it's a bit of a uh, family history thing, I guess. Uh, he was, he wasn't, an, he wasn't a, an official member. But he sort of ran in the circles of the Palestinian Communist Party. Um, I'm not saying that, you know, they were, they were, you know, pro gays or anything. This is, we talk about this is in the sixties. Um, and my dad did carry a lot of the stigma, did, uh, stigmatize homosexuality, um, for as, as long as I knew him before he passed away, even. Um, but I think because of that, because he was in that society and he, he was living in Jordan and Palestine, where there's a lot of, in, into religious uh, connections, it's, it's not unheard of for uh, to be in a village where you know Christian families would visit their Muslim neighbors for Eid, and Muslim families would visit their Christian neighbors for Christmas and stuff. Um, yeah, and my mum grew up in a part of Lebanon, which is right next to Tripoli, Edmina, which is like the Christian corner of Tripoli. So for her, she was already exposed to all this stuff as well. So I guess I was lucky in that sense that I, I had parents who sort of taught me that you know religion is one thing and what people believe in is one thing it's just more about the institutions around them that we need to question um and the systems and the uh and stuff like that and so and that's why like you were saying uh Elia, like um it doesn't matter if someone's secular or atheist they can still be awful homophobes and and that doesn't that's not, nothing to do with their religious or lack thereof beliefs it's more about the the patriarchy it's more about the systemic and institutional uh, issues that come with being part of that thing. <laughs> um, so I guess, you know, it's just a way, just trying to find a way to dismantle that. And yeah, I guess, yeah. That's the thing, because for me, I, when I, when I, th- again, I, I, growing, I grew up in Mount Lebanon and then I went to Beirut to do my undergrad when I was 20 and I stayed there for five years before then, then moving out of Lebanon. Um, and A, growing up in a very, I guess, as I said, a pretty sm- relatively small, homogeneous, quote unquote, more or less, and definitely conservative, definitely right wing um, community in school, especially even more so than at, at home or, or in the neighborhood. I went to a private Catholic school. Um, Beirut was like, oh, the opening, you know, it was, I discovered more people, I met more people and whatnot. I definitely had more Muslim friends than I did before because I didn't know that many beforehand. And, but that came hand in hand with also knowing more queer folks, you know, like it, it's almost like I just, I gotten to know more people. And that was like, oh, some people are also Muslim, some are not, and blah, blah, blah. And I grew up when, um, I mean, I, I went to university two, one year after Mashua Leila became a big thing in, because they were also, they were also born at the UB, at the American University of Beirut. Um, and, you know, the lead frontman being also openly, openly, openly queer and the Muslim, and all of that stuff. And it kind of became, and also going to Ramad, going to Iftar and other folks coming, you know, it just became a thing and no one, there was never a moment where anyone kind of sat down and said, hey, what we're doing right now is very progressive, isn't it? It was just mm. kind of a normal mixing, melting pots, pot, you know, that yeah. type of thing. And today, almost the only, if, one of the few things that the, all of the right-wing parties, which for me is basically all of the dominant ones in Lebanon, whether it's the Falanges, whether it's Hezbollah, whether it's the force, Lebanese forces, whether it's Amal or whatever, uh, other than having right-wing um, economic policies as well, but one of the few things that they seem to be to agree upon is like uh, we hate women. We're you know we're patriarchal. We hate refugees because obviously that's very easy. And we hate queer we hate queer people. And you can just mm-hmm. remove certain again take a speech by Nasrallah and take a speech by don't know the Rab people or whatever that because they're Christians people don't know this. Uh, and it's kind of the same. So it's like who are you? Who is this enemy that you keep on re- referencing? You know and whatnot because clearly there's something. Else going mm. on, in my opinion, in terms of like mm. their own internal crises within their own communities or whatever. But anyway, I do sometimes wonder like, where the growing up as the first generation or second generation Australian, uh, being the children of immigrants, the first, um, how, why in my generation there were still a lot of people who had this idea of how to be an Arab, like a, 
an Arab man had to act in a certain way and they have to do cer- behave certain ways and do certain things to sort of gain the re- respect and uh, honor of being an Arab man. And there was a, a, obviously some set, set of rules for women as well, but um, I was too busy dealing with the, my internal monologue of whether, asking, am I gay? Am I not gay? Am I gay? Am I not gay? For so long that I didn't really notice that. But for me, it was almost like, you know, good growing up in Western Sydney, which is a very working class, multicultural part of Sydney that we don't know when you rarely, if ever, see in popular culture um, with Australia, anything from Australian pop culture is always going to be the white, blonde-haired guy on surfy, whatever, which is, that is not the Australia that I know. Um, 60% of Australians have, have parents born, or grandparents born overseas. Um, and anyway, so I'm going off track here, but like, I think because of that insulated community, we're so far removed from the from Lebanon, from everywhere in our world, uh, that these old ideals, patriarchal ideals, are sort of passed on to the next generation. And and that often came with them. The men had to love their football. They had to love their souped-up cars. They had to act and dress in a certain way, their big gold change or their big chain with their sword on it. Or, you know, they have to wear their Adidas track pants or their Everlast jumpers and their bum bags and look like gangsters when they don't really live. There's no such thing as a ghetto in Sydney. Um, they just sort of emulate that uh, Black American culture, internalise it with them. Could, to be fair, I think the Arab community in Sydney is marginalised compared to the rest of the society there, but nothing like Black Americans. Um, uh Anyway, so it could have that, and I, d- I didn't really fit those ideals. Like, you know, I was someone who's very bookish. I loved reading my books. I sort of, you know, loved watching movies. I just sort of, and I just happened to have a lot of female friends, a lot of question marks about me. And I just challenged these ideas of masculinity for some people. Um, you know, you open up my old iPod and you see all these songs from Mariah Carey, Whitney Houston. Why is he not listening? Why is he not listening to Tupac? Why is he not listening to all these other rappers, you know, that all the other guys my age were? Um, so I, I just broke all these rules and I just like, I didn't realize until I became an adult that like, I just like, in a, I was inadvertently cha- challenging the patriarchy that my family had inherited. Mm. And, um, and I wonder, I don't know if, I don't know, I don't think it's fully resolved yet. At least, at least for my extended family, definitely not resolved, but in my immediate family, I think it's come a long way since I've come out to them. Um, and, you know, very lucky to be where I am, where I'm at, but, uh, a, a, like 15, 20 years ago, a very different story. Like, you know, there was that expectation for me to get married, to have kids, to pass on the family name. Um, even though my brother had already had kids and was passing on the family name, there's still the expectation of me, the other son, to do it. Um, and, uh, yeah, it was just like, and then, yeah, like, it was just the whole thing. And they just like sort of turned that on, on his head. And I guess, I guess I'm proud of that, but at the same time, I should not have had to go through that. Um, and no one should ever have to go through that. People should be able to live have we want without meeting anyone's expectations so mm-hmm. yeah i'm i'm reminded of like uh so i'm i'm egyptian i immigrated to the states when i was about seven years old um and i had the i guess um traditional immigrant experience in that my parents were very much rejecting American culture and, but also trying to find a way to simulate us in a way. Right. So like English was very much driven and Arabic was like, don't speak Arabic. You have to get rid of your accent. Um, And it wasn't until in my adulthood that I found that, Oh yeah, my parents in Egypt on Christmas, they had, they would go see their uh, exchange, like gifts with their uh, Christian friends and like had these relationships, which blew my mind because growing up, it was like, it's haram to practice Christmas. It's haram to engage in these. It's haram to do. Right. And it became so like, you're now becoming Americanized, associated with Americanization and losing your culture and losing who you are. And for me, as I, right, holding that queerness in me, as I was growing up, and reckon, coming to terms with what it is, it became easier to be like, oh no, so I don't, I reject God. I reject my my culture and try to figure out this, what seemed like a mainstream, like the American culture seemed more like, um, it's figured out how to strip away all this stuff, right? Obviously that did not like quickly realize that that's not the case, that especially after post 9-11 um, and really sitting with the reflections of like what it means to be a racialized body in the United States, Um, and also like for me, the return to religion was sitting there reflecting on 
the relationships that I was observing as a child that were being erased, right? Like the male in the family who is very effeminate, right? Belly dancing and doing things, but nobody's talking about who this person is and why they've never married or the aunt who has never like married or done and like always been a solo, right? It's like these little things that now I look back and I'm like, huh, what, what, what's happening there, right? Um, and, and it becomes like really obvious for me how trauma plays into this. And like, this is something that kept coming up for the book too, especially for people who were leaving their homeland, their families leaving, especially under war. Uh, there's multiple stories in the book talking about this and the latching of the culture. And you brought it in Elias too. It's like the latching in what was known and erasing everything else out of fear of losing what you have um, and how that is a continuous process of colonization and erasure of our people. Uh, and what it means to actually reown and acknowledge the rainbow of what our people are, you know? Uh, yeah. That's been really one of the themes that hit hard for me in the book. Yeah. I mean, I'm, I'm, I'm a big, I've only just recently realized this. I think it was me becoming an immigrant myself in the UK. So it's, it's weird. I feel like I'm the son of immigrants who's become an immigrant. Um, and I just realized like, I'm just tired playing the good immigrant the role. Um, and that's what I did for most of my life in Sydney. Like even up until my late twenties, I was doing that. And I was constantly playing the good immigrant, constantly playing, you know, I, I would never hide that I was Palestinian. I would never hide that I was Lebanese. I was very open about that. But I would avoid saying the words like, you know, I would avoid saying Palestinians have a right to resist because people mm-hmm. would interpret that the wrong way. Um, or they might interpret it the right way, but they, they, they just can't come to agree with it because they've got their white Eurocentric ways of how we should be. And mm-hmm. um, so, yeah, it just, I think, the whole idea of being a good immigrant is really exhausting. And once I was able to sort of realize I just had let go of that, and I'm just, I don't, I don't waste time trying to be the good immigrant anymore. It's become, it's allowed me to embrace my culture a lot more. Um, it's allowed me to sort of do things with my culture in a, in the capacity that I have living in London, um, mm-hmm. in a way that I probably would never be able to do that if I was still playing the good immigrant. And, and even these small things like, you know, like having friends over for Matt Newbell or something or, you know, going to uh, a picnic and just uh, and people playing like, you know, some Arabic music and dancing, doing the dub jazz, mm-hmm. small things like that, you know. Um, yeah. Things that I probably would have cringed at seeing my uncles and aunties do at the picnics in Sydney. Now I'm suddenly doing it myself and I realise like, oh, shit, this is, like, this is what, this is what, this is liberating. Um yeah. And, uh, and even just going to Palestine, pro- the pro- Palestine protests in London and being, having, grabbing the, uh, the last speaker from someone and just using Arabic chants and just seeing how many people actually respond. And, mm-hmm. uh, and it's always really nice to see. Yeah, there's a lot of people who do respond, um, whether they're Arabs or not. And it's just like, you know, just, it's like a nice reminder to everyone that, you know, we're not here to speak English all the time. Um, so, you know, Palestinians do speak Arabic. And, um, but yeah, so I guess, Small things like that, and even like you know, I mean, I'm I'm not particularly a, a practicing really, uh, Christian myself, but I do look forward to Orthodox Easter all the time because one, it's several weeks a week after regular Easter, so I get the chocolates. But two, it's like it's a, it's, a, it's, a, it's easier to have friends over for Easter when they're, they're not com- when you're not competing to ev- with everyone else's Easter plans. <laughs> so it's just like I have more people over for lunch. It's great, um, and. <laughs> Yeah, it's just and it's small things like that. It's just like even my husband's actually. My mom came to spend five weeks with us recent uh, a few months ago because I had an operation and stuff, and um, and then she left. And my husband is like, "You are so much like your mother." I'm like, "Oh." Yeah. <laughs> <laughs> um, but yeah, it's just hearing small things like it's really validating. It's really uh, empowering to know that I am. The older I get, the more I embrace and practice my culture. And it's, yeah, it's just a very liberating. I'm not worried about what people think anymore. And if they do have a problem, that's on them. Mm-hmm. Um, and I don't worry about whether what I'm doing is performative or cringe or not. It, it, it is what, this is what I, this is what I know. And, um, there's no one right or wrong way to do it. Um, yeah. and I think I used to be caught up on the, oh, this is not how, you know, we should we normally do it. I don't see how other people do it. Oh, we don't do it that way. Why you know? Mm-hmm. But there are reasons why we don't do it that way. You know, it's just a whole, everyone's got their own story. I'm going off on a Yeah, I, I certainly relate to that as well. <laughs> yeah. <laughs> yeah, I think the other side of that coin 
is those of us who um, diaspora kids who are trying to be the good diaspora kid, right? The ones who don't want to explore those things that are deemed, oh, that's 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 the that's the white culture. That's that's not us. Um, and what it does in shutting down those parts of us to try to appease our family and the culture that we think we know or we understand, but it's really just another form of authority being imposed on us, right? Um, yeah. Yeah, yeah, yeah. I think I think also just uh, letting go of the good immigrant or good, the good diaspora mentality right. has allowed me to sort of feel way more comfortable, way more at ease with being gay and Arab. Like, I don't, I don't think I realized until I moved to London how often I would separate those two identities. They're rarely ever intertwined. Um, mm-hmm. Even when I was the editor at Star Observer in Sydney, like it just always felt uncomfortable in queer spaces. So what dominant, dominated by white people. And then I go to Arab spaces and then, I mean, it's dependent on which kind of other created queer Arab space different. That's when I felt most at home. Mm. But then you go like I was part of the Arab Council Australia board. And even though the board mm. itself was really progressive, the CEO was fiercely pro queer po- issues, pro marriage equality and stuff. She's an amazing ally. There's some community events that I have to attend as a board member that I was like, Oh, okay. I've got to be careful what I say. Um, and, but now I just don't worry about that. I'm like, you know, you know, I, I'm pretty sure I've, I've, I've sort of, uh, where I work now is a predominantly Arab, uh, staff members. Everyone knows, uh, everyone there knows I'm an open, raging homo and no one said anything about it. Like, you know, if, if anything, like, you know, I remember like my, the managing executive director of the office, when I told him that I needed a month off for my operation, he was like, if you and your husband need anything, please let me know. <laughs> and then I was like, oh, that's really nice of him. <laughs> um, so I would just, it was just really, uh, really nice to have that. Like, it's just like, it's not hard to be inclusive of everyone. That's just like, it's really, yeah. t- really nice to know it's, it's possible, you know, um, I'm not be, not be worried about that stuff anymore. So, yeah. I, I have a question in regards. Uh, so within the context of the current genocide of Gaza and pinkwashing, um, mm-hmm. your book obviously is a very counter to that narrative. Um, have you heard have you gotten pushback recently with within the context of the current genocide um is your book coming back up to counter all this um, yeah yeah um 100 uh the people are sharing the book a lot on social media in the context of pink washing and how and stuff i just wish the book did address it more directly um yeah. that that the that was the I wouldn't say it was a missed opportunity because I never told the writers to write a specific thing. It just never came up. At the time of when the book was being put together, it wasn't really a pressing thing. It's a um, second book for you. Possibly. <laughs> um, oh. <laughs> <laughs> um, but, yeah, but look, I mean, even a few months before October 7, I wrote an opinion piece for Gay Times magazine um, about Sam Smith's then-planned show at, in Tel Aviv and how there was a big push to for them to sort of pull out of the show and cancel the show altogether. Even though there was another queer performer play, playing, Callum Scott, uh, he was a, he's a British gay singer. Um, Sam Smith got more heat, I think, because they were pop, pop, they're quite big on both sides of the Atlantic. And, um, yeah, so there was a big push for them to sort of, like, you know, boycott the show, don't, don't perform at all. So I did that piece, and that went kind of viral amongst the Zionists. Um, so the block button got a very good workout in those, in that week or so. Um, I just refused to engage with people who don't want to see me as a human being. Um, yeah. but yeah, there was a, yeah, it was just like, they just weren't happy with the fact that a Palestinian was speaking about pinkwashing about another queer performing in Tel Aviv in, in a city that mm-hmm. was, you know, not far from my, my, my family, my dad's home city as well in Yaffa. Um, so it was very personal for me. And, um, so there was a lot of pushback from that. I probably got more pushback than that than anything else I've ever written. And mm-hmm. um, and the book has come up again uh, since October a lot. Um, but I think uh, whenever people say, oh, this book touches on pinkwashing, I kind of have to correct them. I'm like, that's really nice that you think that, but it doesn't. It's just, it's, there's definitely Palestinian experiences in there, yes. But not at one point, not at any point do people say this is, talked about pink question or Israeli thing. We don't want to, uh, in many ways, it might be a good thing. I don't want to give attention to Zionists in the book. Um, this is not their space. Yeah. Um, so, yeah. yeah, so I guess, but 
it is a good example. It is a good, hard, rock solid evidence to say that, you know, we exist. We're not going to go anywhere. Um, doesn't matter what the Zionist narrative tries to do to erase us. The more they try to erase us, well, we're just going to come out even more, you know? I was going to so, say, I was going to say exactly that. It's just the fact that it exists, the fact that it does not take that, it doesn't take the pink washing narrative, or whatever, no. even into consideration is in and of itself a refutation of pink washing. Cause like, yep. it's always powerful. When you, when you respond to pink washing, you're always on the defensive. You're always like, no, but we also have this and that. And it's like, well, we, we're just going to ignore you. We're just going to do the thing and that's it. Yeah. That's a good point. Yeah. We said the terms. Yeah. yeah. That's yeah. a really good point. Yeah. 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 So, uh, <laughs> uh, yeah, so we're almost out of time just because we, we can't do this for 10 hours, even though I think we want to, uh, any, uh, final thought reflections from, from all of you, Edie, uh, no particular order. Uh, I think it's, it's one of those open-ended conversations that I don't know we ended up, we, I mean, even this point, I think is a good one that ultimately is about like, who gets to define the terms of the story, uh, is, is I think, you know, in many ways, the point of this book. So I, I pretty, even though, again, as I said, it's not, it's not like quote unquote my experience, but it's also not my, my not, not, not <laughs> in that sense. Like it's close enough. And of course, like also loved ones and whatnot it affects them even more directly. Sorry, affects them even more directly than it does me. And I want more of those books out there so that it's just, it's not to mention the pink washing. So it's not just we're responding to stereotypes and trolls, but actually as this book does, just creating something new and that's it instead of always being on a defensive of it all mm-hmm. Mm-hmm. yeah mm-hmm. yeah i've always been a fan of you know I, I remember when i when i pitched this book to saki my publisher um i made it clear that you don't want it to be a response to anyone i didn't want it to be like you know queer ab writing back um i wanted us to so i want it to be a, a thing of where we're creating space for ourselves without mm-hmm. the intervention of white people telling us how to tell our stories um and uh yeah and i i mean I just hope that, that more like this comes out, whether I do a book two of another. I mean, there have been a couple of anthologies that have come out. There's a new one, that, one that came out in Canada a few months ago. Forget the name of it, but um, it's uh, independent. Queer glossary. The Queer Out no, Glossary. Uh, no, that, 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 yeah, yeah. Queer Out Glossary is Madhuran. He's, uh, he's mm. pu- the same publisher as me. Yeah. Um, there's, that, there's that. That's an example. There's another anthology that was published in Canada from a, a few months before that. Um, I think El Huruba, I think it was called, um, the collection yeah. of short stories and stuff. So the conversation is definitely growing. The discourse, there's more added being added to the discourse. And I think the most important part of that is that none of these examples of books that have been, that have been published are in response to anything. They're just people saying, well, we've got a story to tell. It's up to you if you want to read it, you know? Um, and, yeah, thankfully people are reading it. People are talking about it because otherwise, how are we going to progress? Yeah, yeah, yeah. I'm I'm really appreciative of this book and um, the fact that it is approached as we're just here. We're not trying to counter any narrative. We're just sharing our stories. It felt very intimate, like a honestly reading someone's diary. Each each snippet was like someone's personal diary piece, um, and yeah, in this moment where we get so caught up in the heady stuff and the theory and like the trying to understand what's happening here and the big picture and the dynamics to bring it down to the human lived experience in this way is really one moving and two grounding um, and affirming of the reality of what our world actually is. Um, And also how like it really comes down to our relationships and how we show up with each other and hold space with each other and how we move and create the new world that we want, you know? Yeah, hundred percent. Yeah, yeah. Yeah. Okay. Well, on I like I like it when we have nice notes to end on. It's not always the case <laughs> on this podcast, <laughs> <laughs> but I like the I like it when it does happen. So, uh, yeah, I guess all that stuff is thanking Elias, of course. Thank you for joining us, and uh, as always, Leila and Isra for making this into a thing that hopefully more and more people enjoy listening to as well. Uh, yeah, thanks for joining us. Thank you so much for having me, all of you. I really appreciate it. It was great to have you with us.